Well, a fine Tuesday to you folks out there. Welcome to Takeout Tuesday. I'm John Barba and joined by uh, my colleague, Rick Mayo. And uh, we're excited to have you with us today, whether it's afternoon where you are or uh, where Rick is, it's still it's still pre-dawn, right? Out in, <laughs> out in Nevada, I don't know. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Here in, here in New Hampshire, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous Tuesday, uh, early afternoon. And uh, we're psyched to have you with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here on, uh, on yet another Takeout Tuesday. Today's session is going to be interesting. We're going to take a little bit of a deep dive into uh, some Takeout domestic hot water recirculation solutions, particularly the 006E3, um, which we consider that uh, it's, it's, it's becoming the industry workhorse for domestic hot water recirculations because it fits so many residential applications and its adjustability gives you flexibility and gives you the ability to install these things without really having to resort to a circuit setter if you know what you're doing that's what we're going to focus on today right on. we'll also talk about the smart plug and the proper way to control a domestic hot water recirculation system as well as some of the dangers of oversizing and we're going to talk about some of the new stainless steel models out there that might give you some pretty interesting options as well when putting together domestic hot water recirculation system so we're really really psyched to have you with us and this is going to be a fun and hopefully fruitful uh, hour for, for, for y'all. Um, I want to just share some best practices. If anybody's new to Takeo Tuesday, we do have some best practices, some things that you folks can do out there to get the most out of this hour, all right? The first thing is let's pretend, all right? Let's pretend we're not talking over the internet. Let's pretend we're actually in a classroom together and we can see each other. Uh, that What that means for you is, Putting the phone aside, okay, just take, take take this thing and turn it upside down and leave it off or whatever. Uh, leave, put the phone aside. Don't, uh, you know, resist the temptation to check Facebook or check your email over the course of the next hour. Let's pretend we're in a classroom together and we can see each other. Treat it like a classroom exercise. That'll help you all stay really, really focused and engaged in what we're talking about. The other way to stay focused and engaged, again, treat this like you would treat a normal classroom exercise and take notes. Take a couple of seconds, go grab a pad of paper and a pen and take notes while we're going through this. A lot of folks think, well, if I'm taking notes, I can't really pay attention. I'll, I'll, got, I'll miss something. And that can't be further from the truth. Studies show that taking notes is actually a very powerful and, um, and, and, beneficial tool for staying focused on the material and that way also you'll have a written record of what we what we talked about okay today now yeah you're going to get an email tomorrow at noon uh, or at this exact same time you're going to get an email that is going to give you a link to the recording of this webinar and that's cool you can watch it as many times as you want but take notes as you go along that's going to help you stay focused and help you get the most out of this and the other thing Ask questions. As Albert Einstein says, the smartest people are those who ask questions. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm, I, I need you guys to ask questions because quite frankly, and Rick can verify this, I'm not the most interesting of people, okay? Oh. I, I can get pretty boring after a while as I drone on and on and on. But uh, ask some questions. Ask questions as they come up to you and we will address them as they, as they come along. Now, how do we ask questions, you may ask? <laughs> Here's how you ask questions. Uh, on your control panel, there's a little section way down at the bottom that says questions slash chat. You type in your questions there and hit send and they'll show up magically before Rick and I and we can address them. So what I would like you all to do before we get started, and this might be the, is, I think this is the third time I've said y'all, isn't it? And y'all. I'm, I'm from Southern New Hampshire, okay? But, but, <laughs> but, but I guess that counts, I guess, I don't know. So what I'd like you to do please, if you would, just type in a hi, hello, how are you, some kind of a comment, so I know that you know how to do this, and most importantly, I know that you are hearing me, <laughs> okay? So if you could type that in for me, I'd appreciate it. Jerry, thank you. Coming Gordon, in. Excellent. Gene, here they come. Brian, all right, rocking and rolling. We are ready yeah. to roll. All right, so let's get this party started, shall we? All right, the, the, uh, the, the topic, of course, is domestic hot water solutions, and a deep dive into some of the products that you can use for domestic hot water recirculation. But just to recap maybe what we went over two weeks ago, why do we have domestic hot water recirculation? What is the point of all of this? Well, first is to reduce the weight. The weighting, as Tom Petty said, is the hardest part, right? Uh, reduce the weight for hot water. How many of you have stood stark naked out in the shower with your hand, just like we see here, under the shower, waiting for that water to get hot? I'd say that's most of us, all right? 
domestic hot water recirculation can reduce that weight. And the weight is is the bigger the home, the longer the weight. The weight is the way it works. The bigger homes have more uh, hot water fixture units. When you have more hot water fixture units, that's going to require bigger pipe to get the you know, to get the volume of hot water out there. One byproduct of bigger pipe and longer runs, plus federally mandated fixture flow rate regulations. All right. The, the, the result of that is lower velocities through the pipe. And when the velocities get lower through the pipe, it just simply takes longer for the water to get there. All right, it's not unusual to have a two, three, four minute wait. Some of you folks out there tell us if, in, in your own experiences, how long do you folks wait for hot water, provided you don't have a research system already, okay? If you do have a research system, yeah, go ahead and tell us you do. But if you don't, what, 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 if, what kind of waits have you seen? The worst I've ever seen was four and a half, five minutes. Uh, from wow. from from somebody, I didn't believe it until you know she she turned on the faucet and said, "Here, wait, <laughs> wait, it was four four and a half five minutes." Yeah, um, there's coming in one and three and yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's not unusual for people to wait. Now, older homes, generally speaking, the wait isn't as long simply because just think of the plumbing in an older home. It's stacked, right? You've got the water heater in a central location down downstairs. And the bathroom fixture clusters or the, 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 the kitchen fixture clusters or whatever are kind of all within a few feet of the main stack because we had cast iron drain pipe and you couldn't spread out, you know, economically. So yeah. older homes, the wait isn't really as, as long unless they have, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 the types of pipe that clog up over time, you know, the old uh, uh, you know, galvanized pipe, that'll, that'll, that'll get you. But in, in reality, it just doesn't, it, it, it's, it's a shorter wait because it's a shorter run. Newer homes, more spread out, more fixture units, it just does slow down a little bit. So those lower velocities can create a longer wait. In addition, all right, in addition, we want to reduce the waste, okay? When you're waiting for water to show up, well, that's two and a half gallons per minute down the drain in, in the average shower, all right? So if you're waiting for hot water, and what did we have, uh, you know, three minutes here, one of, the, one of the waits was three minutes from Dennis, uh, or from Daniel, rather. Okay, that's seven and a half gallons of water down the drain, literally down the drain. Now that costs money for to get the water. It costs money if you're on public sewage to get rid of the water. And you're making that water heater work a little bit extra. The Department of Energy has determined that simply waiting and wasting uh, for hot water, the average family of four can waste about 12 to 14,000 gallons of water every year, right down the drain, just waiting for the hot water to show up. In terms of dollars and cents, roughly one third the cost of making hot water, meaning the water that you use and the energy that you use to make it, as much as one third of that can actually quite literally go down the drain and be of no use to anybody. So we want to reduce the weight. We want to reduce the waste. We want to do both. So that's that's yeah. why we look at domestic hot water recirculation. Now, in our last episode, we discussed sizing and we showed you the TACO domestic hot water right size circulator sizing program, which was really pretty cool. And one of the things that we learned is bigger ain't better, is it, Rick? Nope. Nope. Big. And some of the some of the Rick describe to the group some of the some of the dangers of oversizing a domestic hot water recirculation pump. Well, if you have the older style pipes like copper, and most people do, um, that that's that good old thing, velocity erosion corrosion. If we're if the fluid's moving too quickly through the pipes, uh, it's going to eventually eat it away, kind of like the, the way we got the Grand Canyon. Uh, even uh, nowadays, over the last you know 20 years or so, 25 years or so, people are using PEX. Well, PEX, uh, you know, in open Potable systems uh, can have some issues. It's it's not erosion corrosion, but it's oxidation, and there's kind of a some recipe stuff that uh, uh, causes that. You know, you, it's a perfect storm scenario that causes both. So, you know, one pipe can't blame the other for you know uh, not failing as fast, et cetera. It, it happens to all pipes out there. I think the the the, the thing the takeaway here, folks, is hot chlorinated water yep. running at high velocities continuously is the kryptonite for any pipe all right yep. that's the kryptonite yep. and that's going to turn your plumbing system into a sprinkler system and it can happen in relatively short order and it's all a function of and it's ultimately a function of the things that we can control we can control the size of the pump all right by sizing it properly and we can control the control strategy 
So as long as we don't oversize the pump, plug it in and let it run, because that's easy and cheap, we can we can impact this. We can prevent yep. bad things from happening. Yeah. Right. So bigger ain't better. In this case, bigger ain't better. Just no way, no two ways around it. Yeah. All righty. Uh, some of the requirements or the limitations for. Hey John. Uh, yes, sir. Let me interrupt. Uh, so far, I can see your beautiful mug, and that's it. You haven't shown us your screen yet. Oh dear. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh dear. I thought maybe I you were just preliminarily, you know. Going oh up, goodness. and you were gonna, you know, say that you're gonna show us our screen. Uh, there you go. All right. Oh now my God. everybody give. Is everybody now seeing your screen or, or no? <laughs> and I had such great slides too. Particularly, <laughs> let's go back. I want to go back because this was my best picture. Bigger ain't better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh okay. my word. It doesn't matter how many of these things you've done, folks. If you forget to hit one key button, it all falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to oh, say boy. something, but I thought, uh, he's just I doing know. a good long lead in. Oh, so. no, no, no. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Everybody, everybody needs an editor. Everybody needs someone to watch out for him, folks. So good. Thank you very much. And I apologize, folks. Boy, you miss some great stuff. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> anyway. Bigger ain't better, as we said, and here are right. some guidelines for uh, for your domestic hot water recirculation lines. If we have a dedicated recirc line, all right. If we're talking half inch, and most of the time they're half inch, either half inch copper or half inch PEX, because it's easy and cheap, right? Here's the limitation for the recirc portion when the pump is running. This is the limitation of flow through the recirc portion. If it's half inch copper, we're looking at uh, 1.6 gallons per minute. If you stretch it out to three feet per second velocity, you could go up to 2.4. But again, being on the conservative side, we don't know how chlorinated the water is, etc. 1.6 GPM is really a good uh, limitation to work with. Yeah. Uh, if you're dealing with half inch packs, same thing. 1.4 gallons per minute is a good limitation to work with. Now, this doesn't limit the flow of water when you turn a faucet on, that flow, to, the, that flow is going to be dependent upon the size of the pipe and the, and the street pressure coming in. And as you can see, there's, you know, the limits there are, are well, you know, well within the performance requirements of a plumbing system. It's just the research portion that we're, that we're concerned about. Rick? Hey, John. Yeah. Um, your, your third bullet there is talking about PEX, but you actually circled type L copper. So that, that's another Oops. That's another thing on the back. No, no, meaning right. you pull up that other PEX one, it's going to say something different. Okay. Yeah, PEX is going to be 1.2 gallons per minute. Yeah, okay. So PEX, okay, thank you again. Everybody needs an editor. PEX is 1.2 gallons per minute. So type L and M copper, 1.6, 1.4. Uh, half inch PEX, we're going to be looking at 1.2 gallons per minute as your limitation. As your yep. limitation. And that's, a, that's not necessarily a target. That's your high limit, okay? That is your high limit. It's not a target. It's a it's a maximum. Yeah, it's right. a maximum. Good point. All righty. So taking this into account, let's take a look at circulators. All right. Let's take a look at what we can do here. And I want to look at the workhorse as we talked about the Takeo 006 E3. It's an ECM high efficiency uh, circulator designed specifically for domestic hot water recirculation. That's its primary use. And as you can see, it's kind of set up for uh, domestic hot water recirculation with its uh, with its union connections. Now, uh, it 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 can be set up to be a pretty powerful circulator, 13 feet ahead max, 11 gallons per minute max, if that's the hydraulics of the system. Um, but it does, like any circulator, it does follow the hydraulics of the system. It it it, it respects the hydraulics of the system, as you'll see. Now, as you as you can also see on that dial, low, medium, and high settings. It's not a click, click, click thing like a three-speed circulator would be. That dial itself is actually a smooth dial, like almost like a volume dial mm -hmm. on your radio. Okay, it's a volume dial. As we turn it to the left, to the right, the circulator will go faster. As we turn it to the left, the circulator will go will go slower. Uh, so it's an infinitely adjustable or infinitely variable fixed speed circulator. I can set it up anywhere between min and max. As you can also see, uh, there's little check marks there for both the 003 and 006. If you had a 00, if you're taking out, let's say, a Takeo standard efficiency old 003 circulator and you wanted to put this in to replace it, well, there's a mark for the 003. Uh, and same thing for the mark for the 006. They're marked as reference points 
on that on that adjustable dial. Now you take you could either take a coin or a, a, a screwdriver and insert it in in this slot right here, and that'll help you move that dial. So those are the reference points, and that's how you would move the dial. Now, the other thing about this circulator is it is, uh, according to the Hydraulic Institute's energy ratings, it is the most efficient domestic hot water specific circulator on the market with an energy rating somewhere between, you know, at 162 at high speed, 174 at low speed. The closest domestic hot water specific circulator to this is, I believe, the Grundfos 1555 DHW which uh, maxes out at 151. So this is considerably more expen more uh, more not more expensive. <laughs> it's considerably I actually I think it's less expensive technically. It's <laughs> it's significantly more efficient than 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 any other pump you're going to find out there. That is that is specific for domestic hot water recirculation. We're going to show you a few other DHW circulators that are actually more efficient than this, but they're not DHW specific. They are stainless steel, which means you can use them, but this is the most efficient DHW specific circulator on the market. Yeah. Alrighty. Now we showed you also last time the DHWR size right circulator sizing tool. And if you want to go back and watch that video again, uh, if you have a if you were attended, you have uh, the session two weeks ago, you have a link to that. But also you can find it via our website or or our YouTube channel and see how that size right sizing tool works. It's a very easy to use and very um, simple yet sophisticated and very accurate way to size your DHW circulator. What the end result is you're going to get something like this. This is a, a 006 uh, E3 performance curve. And if you put all your information in, including it, uh, including the you know allowances for pipe for you know for valves and fittings, plus allowances for the head loss through a, a mixing valve, it will give you both the flow and the head. Now, since we since we specified uh, half inch Type M copper, the the, the program says at, at, for our recirc for our recirc line size, the program says right, I don't care about anything else. 1.6 GPM is what we're looking at, and we yep. can reduce it if we want to to make yep. it lower. But it'll give us 1.6 GPM, and at 1.6 GPM, it calculated 11.35 feet ahead. Now, what the, the tool does for you is it spits out this uh, pump performance curve, but also note the red dot right here. That yeah. red dot is 1.6 GPM at 11.35 feet ahead. Now, that's handy, isn't it? Because what do you it think is. you do with that? What do we do with that, Rick? Well, you just look at the dial now and you kind of extrapolate between high and maximum and boy, you're going to get really close. Yeah. What's it going to do? It's going to look kind of like this, right? Yeah. There yeah. you see the dial, it's right set to high, but what we would wind up doing is simply turning that to the right a little bit and kind of get it just halfway between high and max. Yeah. Or when you take it out of the box, actually, it's going to be set to max. So in that case, take it out of the box, you turn it slightly to the left. So we're in between max and high. And in fact, if you left this just at high, if you turned it right to the 006, well, we wouldn't have 1.6 GPM. We'd have something less than that, but again, the 1.6 is a max, it's not a target. So we'd still be fine if we set it just to if we set it just to high right at the 006 setting. If and that would be a little bit safer. But here's yeah. how you set this thing up without having to buy and mess with a circuit setter, which is kind of the way the, the industry might be going if we don't look at at, at at proper sizing of circulators. All right. How are the questions going out there, Rick? Do we have any questions from the uh, gang? No, no, yeah. I just yeah, nothing uh, specific. Everybody was wondering where the slides were. All right. <laughs> Is New Hampshire still a state? Asked Dan Roth. Now, why would you ask that question? Of course, it's still a state. It's one of the 50, right, in the Republic. So, yes, of course, it's still a state. And we still live free or die. That's the way we, that's the way we roll here. <laughs> all right. Some 0063 facts and figures. Uh, the 0063, like all of the Taco 00 series ECM circulators, is equipped with sure start and uh, our sure start unblocking and purging. What does that mean? Well, I'm sure everybody out there has at one point in their careers dealt with a circulator that had a locked rotor. It can happen to uh, you know, black iron oxide or minerals or whatever in the in the circulator can cause that if it sits idle for long periods of time, it can cause that circulator to lock up so the impeller doesn't spin. 
And if uh, that happens and the circulator is told to run and it doesn't, you burn out the motor, the, the circulator is dead, you got to replace it. Well, this circulator has a little bit of brains to it, meaning if there's power, if the, if the circulator is told to run, the brain inside says, well, I'm told to run. The impeller should be spinning. If the impeller isn't spinning, something's wrong. So what it will do is it will actually go into its unblocking mode, which means it will it will stop and then it will rattle at full speed, that full 44 watts. It'll go, it'll go back and forth, okay, like this, back and forth, boom, 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 to try to to try to block to try to break whatever's blocking it up. Mm -hmm. So it'll go, all right, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm going to try to break myself free. I'm still stuck. Uh, I'm going to try to break myself free. And it will do this up to 100 times over a 20-minute period. In the wild, what we've seen, two, maybe three cycles, that's usually enough to break out of most situations. Anything that's, you know, the, that locked rotor kind of thing, the normal causes of a locked rotor. Uh, you know, a couple, three times, yeah, it's going to get back into normal operating mode. And it'll solve the problem before anybody knows there even is one. Um, if after 20 minutes and 100 cycles, it's stuck, there's something physically in there, like a stick or something in there, physically keeping that thing from moving. Then what will happen is it just says, you know what, I'm not going to burn anything out. I'm going to stop. That status light you see there is going to turn bright red, and that's going to be a signal for someone to come and take a look. All right. So that's the unblocking mode. The air purging mode actually can be very important in domestic hot water applications, especially if the circulator is mounted down low on the return of the water heater. Uh, if, they, if, that, if that gets air bound, if that impeller, or that volute gets air bound, that's kind of the same thing as getting blocked, only different. Now the, now the impeller's spinning, but it's freewheeling against nothing. Now the brain knows that's not supposed to happen either. So if that does happen, what the circulator will then do is it'll slow down to almost next to nothing and then bam, shoot up to full speed and slow down and speed up and shut down and speed up, try to blast the air out of there. And again, it'll take, it'll do that until the air is gone. So two Don't, things that can help save that circulator. Yes, Rick. Um, along that line, uh, you folks, uh, most of our colored details and even some of the black and white ones will always show a purge valve. So imagine coming on the dedicated return line back to the circulator. We want to see isolation. Then we, there's going to, so there's going to be a shutoff valve. Then there's going to be a circulator. Then there's going to be a T and a purge valve and then the other isolation valve. So start, if you're not doing this already, start building that into your jobs, put that purge because what John's talking about can be virtually eliminated. If you remember to put that, uh, purge valve in the right location, purging that entire research line out and then turn the pump on it. And again, we see this problem and that's one of the reasons that feature is built in there. But again, just like just like a good heating system, we have the purge valves where they're supposed to be and they're there for a reason. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, as you can also see, this is a composite casing. So it is plastic. It's a composite casing with one inch union connections. No, there's no uh, ability to put an IFC in here because of the composite casting that was done. So there's no way to put an IFC in here. If you need that, it has to be external. Uh, but again, those union connections are one inch. Uh, the circulator itself, when you buy it by itself, does not come with uh, come with fittings. You would have to buy them separately if you buy the circulator just by itself. But we offer a wide range of fittings. Really, any one inch union connection can be can be used with the circulator. You know, so whatever pipe, whatever pipe you are in fact using. And also on the box itself is a cross reference chart. If you're replacing something else out there, these are the different circulators that it that it can replace. These are the different circulators that have similar performance. All right, so uh, so cross cross reference is easy, and the fittings are in fact sold separately with the 003. Now, uh, 006 rather, 0063. Now, before I get into some of the specific examples of the where where you can buy the how you else you can buy the 006 E3, I want to talk about controls because controls are also important. We talked about sizing the circulator properly to save the pipes to keep the pipes from uh, from turning into a sprinkler system. Controls are equally important. Now there's most commonly we see three levels of control out there that are kind of the cheapest way to go. Number one is it's just a super dumb pump. You plug it in and there's really no control. It just runs 24 seven. Well, we know that's a recipe for disaster already, especially if the circulator's oversized. So if it's a single, it's a simple regular 
AC circulator plugged into the wall, hey, you're always going to have hot water. That's not going to be a problem. The problem might be that eventually you'll have hot water everywhere, right? And even places you don't want it. So that's the downside of the super simple, super inexpensive, uh, just plug it in and get the hell out of there kind of a kind of approach. The next step up from that is a timer, whether it's an analog timer or a digital timer, like we show here. Now that's a, that's better, but there's some challenges here as well. What do you think some of the challenges are to a timer? Well, first off, somebody's got to set it up, right? Uh, we've had we've had we've had folks on our webinars that say, well, I set it up for my customer, or other folks that say, hey, I just give the customer uh, uh, the instructions and let them do it because they know their they know their their patterns. Either ways either ways fine. It's not one that's right and wrong. It's just that. I don't know about you, but these things aren't that easy to set up. If you've never set one up before, it, it's kind of the, the, the instructions don't really walk you through it. And forget about the digital timer. I'm the guy that had a VCR for decades that was blinking 12. OK, <laughs> you know, don't don't give me this thing because this is you need an electrical engineering degree to do your different things every day of the week. It's crazy. Um, the other thing with both of them is 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 specifically the analog one is, hey, you got a power outage. What do you do? Who goes back and who, whoever goes back and resets those things or you get a you go from daylight you know standard time to daylight savings time who goes back and resets those virtually nobody one of the things we've seen with these things is they've often been set up to run continuously because i don't know what to do with it right? yep so and that's again recipe for disaster a third option is an aquastat which is actually a pretty good option timer plus aquastat is actually not that bad because nope. the aquastat clip it on to the return side of the pump. Once the water temperature reaches a certain temperature there, doesn't matter what the timer's saying, we're gonna shut the pump off, all right? That's a good thing. And if the water temperature drops below, let's say 95, then we'll turn the pump back on again. Now, Rick, where do you think the best place to locate to locate this, uh, this Aquastat actually is? Well, like you'd mentioned on the return side of the circulator, but ideally, if you can get it out just at the farthest fixture group, so when it sees the temperature drop there, it brings a circulator on rather than waiting for it to get all the way back to the mechanical room, which is typically where these would be uh, installed. Right. And the, it's, a, it's, a combi it's a compromise between the most convenient place to put it and the most effective place to put it. The most right. convenient place to put it is just on the inlet side of the circulator because it's right there. Right. The most beneficial place to put it, as you said, is going to be at that, at that farthest fixture because then who cares what the water temperature is between there and the and the mechanical room, right? True. We, we don't really care. Uh, that's the best place to put it. It's also the least convenient place to put it. So if it's a if you if it's if you're adding this and the house is already built, forget it. You can't do it. But a new construction, you know, the best place to put it is is way back at that farthest fixture. Now these are all decent levels of control. Well, no, I'm not even going to say that because you know the dumb pump plugged in, terrible way to control it. Uh, <laughs> timers. Sound good, but there's a lot of drawbacks there. A timer plus Aquastat's not bad. Uh, in today's day and age, we sure as heck can do better, and that's yep. where the that's where the smart plug comes in. What this will do is it'll take any dumb pump and turn it into at least something a little bit more more intelligent. And this is actually a product of ours that uh, won the the innovation award for product of the you know it was best in show for the entire AHR Expo back in 2017 because it had the ability to benefit the widest group of widest number of people. And what it is, it's just a go between between the power source and the pump and it tells the pump when to run and when not to. All right? Yep. Pretty simple, but it it it's it's a little bit more intelligent than that. And it'll work with anybody's pump. Doesn't have to be a Taco pump. It'll work with anybody's pump. You plug it into the wall, plug the pump into the smart plug, and then you have some choices. You can let the smart plug do the thinking or you can uh, or you can control it a little bit more uh, more aggressively, but without having to do any actual programming per se. Well, what does that mean? That sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo. Well, let's talk about it. Again, it's a simple little product. You plug it in to the wall, you plug the pump into this thing. You also, down here, you see a sensor. It comes already wired. So here's a little look at it. Right here, there's a sensor that comes in the package. You strap that sensor on. That sensor is actually very critical. You strap that sensor on to the domestic water, hot water supply pipe as it leaves the mechanical room. So it's already, as you can see, it's already wired into the little plug. 
So you just put the plug the green thing into the into the smart plug and strap on the sensor to the to the supply pipe, leaving the mechanical room. And now we have the ability to control this system. All right, let's talk nice. about how that works. Here you see the smart plug with the sensor and it's being plugged into the wall. What it does is it learns your domestic hot water usage patterns. It learns how you use domestic hot water. And then it replicates those patterns. It spends the first week of its life learning how you use hot water. And then from then on, it'll replicate your usage patterns while at the same time relearning if anything should change. Yep. Right. So it's just kind of cool. So let's say, you know, for the first week, for the first week, what it's going to do is it's going to be in its pulse mode, its learning mode. So it's going to pulse five minutes on, 10 minutes off, 24 seven. So you'll always have hot water no matter when you turn it on but it's also looking for what we call a hot water event, which we'll describe later. If it senses an event, let's say six in the morning on Monday, you get up to take a shower, it's, it says, hey, six in the morning on Monday, somebody got up to take a shower, I'm gonna remember that. And then a week later, that following week, it's out of pulse mode, meaning it's off. It knows someone's gonna take a shower at six in the morning, so what does it do? At five in the morning, it's gonna start pulsing, five minutes on, 10 minutes off, five minutes on, 10 minutes off to get that hot water line primed with hot water so that when you get up at six or five of six or 10 of six or 10 after six or whenever to take a shower, bam, hot water's there. And it does that automatically. And it'll do that, it'll have a Tuesday function, it'll have a Wednesday function, it'll have a Thursday function, and it learns all of the events, the major hot water events during each day, and it'll replicate them. And if things changes, it'll change along with it. So cool. it learns your domestic hot water usage patterns. And again, five minutes on, 10 minutes off. So it doesn't run continuously. It'll run once it, as we said, if it knows you take a shower at six, it'll start pulsing at five. And what it does, it'll pulse for a two hour window between five and seven. So five minutes on, 10 minutes off, five minutes on, 10 minutes off, for a total of 20 minutes each hour. So over that two hour period, it'll run for about 40 minutes. All right, non-continuously, but it'll run for about 40 minutes to keep the hot water line primed. And then after that, it goes off, all right? So the pump doesn't need to run after that point. Again, there's no programming, no dip switches involved. It does all this learning internally. And it also has what we call an optional pulse mode. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say you, and the way things are now, people working from home, a lot of times folks do not have any kind of consistent domestic hot water usage patterns. Or let's say it's a light commercial application where there's no consistent uh, pattern. It's just people could be using hot water any time of the day or night. Well, in the pulse mode, it just simply goes five minutes on, 10 minutes off, 24 seven, okay? So again, it's, it's, it's not quite as efficient as the learning mode, but if, if, it, if the learning mode simply isn't appropriate for the application, you know what? Instead of running it continuously, instead of running 60 minutes every hour, we're gonna run 20 minutes every hour, but it, and we're gonna break it up, we're gonna stagger it, so we don't destroy the pipes in short order. So there's your <laughs> optional pulse mode, which is, again, a fail safe, if you just you wanna make sure I always wanna have hot water, I don't care what time of day or night, you put it in pulse mode, and you can do it safely and effectively. Size the pump right, control it right, we won't have an issue with the, with the pipes. Right on. All righty. Power outages, what it does is it resets after a power outage. If there's a power outage for any length of time, it goes back into its learning mode. It'll go back into a week long pulse mode and it'll relearn, all right? So you don't have to, there's no reprogramming or no, oh God, what do I do now? I don't have to push any buttons or anything. It just does that all automatically after a power outage. And the nice thing about that two hour window I just told you about, it'll readjust when we go from standard to savings and savings to standard time because right, you've got that one hour either side. So it'll automatically re readjust based on your time changes. And also two important things, vacation and exercise mode. So if you go on a vacation, all right, let's say you leave. If, there's, if it senses no hot water uh, usage or no hot water event for 36 hours, it basically shuts off. It says, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna make this thing work because nobody's using any hot water. Then when you come back, and you have an event, it goes back into its learning mode. All right, it'll go right back into its learning mode for you. So you get that, you know, five on, 10 off, 24 seven for a week and it'll relearn. Or if it's in pulse mode, it'll go right back into pulse mode. While it's in vacation mode, it also goes into an exercise mode. So we don't leave the water stagnant in the pipe. So once a week or so, it'll actually run that pipe for a few, run that pump for a few seconds to keep flushing that line out so we don't have stagnant water in there. So those are two 
uh, features or functions that are built into the smart plug. And here you can see it's set up uh, in two different applications, one with a mix valve, one without. And again, we see the sensor, which is even if you're in pulse mode, you have to have the sensor uh, on the on the supply pipe, leaving the hot, leaving the water heater, leaving the mechanical room. And here with the mix valve, it's on the mixed portion uh, of the of the uh, pipe going out again, going out to the plumbing system. So, hey, John. Yes, sir. Uh, go ahead and show them those hose bibs uh, at those locations I was referring to, so they can see. I didn't know you were going to have this slide, so it, it shows exactly what I was. Oh, talking right here. About. Yep. Yep. That hose bib. Check valve and a hose bib right hose here, and a shutoff right valve for purging. There you go. Yep. Right there, and also right here. Well, down, valve down, right there. Yep. 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 Very good. Very good. Very good. All righty. Now that pulse operation again. The first week it's in it's in service. We have five on, ten off. Five on, ten off. Five on, ten off. Twenty four seven. So no matter what time of day you might have a you know you get up, take a shower, or you do use the hot water, the hot water is always going to be there. Five on, ten off. Five on, ten off. Um, so we've got that hot water line primed the entire first week as we're learning. Okay, as we're learning. So as it's learned, after that first week is done, it, it turns the circulator off. But again, let's say it's 6 a.m., we were going to get up and take a shower that Monday. So what's going to happen is at, five, at or 7 a.m., let's say 7 a.m., we were going to take a shower. In this example, what it's going to do, it's going to turn the pump on at 6 a.m. and do that 5 on 10 off, 5 on 10 off uh, until 8 a.m. So what will happen is the water in the pipe will over that first first few minutes will increase up until we get to you know to you know the hot water at the fixture and then it'll stay there you know five on ten off five on ten off for that two hour period then it'll shut off the water temperature in the pipe will drop down to whatever ambient is and let's say we have another event at noon okay well then at noon uh, uh, or, or let's say one o'clock there's an event at one o'clock the pump the, the the smart plug tells the circulator to turn on at noon we get the hot water line primed, it stays up here, and then at two, it stops pumping the water heater, the water starts to drop in, the temperature yeah. starts to drop in the pipe and so on. So again, that's kind of the operation of this, of this, uh, of this package, all right? And, John? yes, sir. Another thing, and you might be gonna say this, so my, my apologies if I'm buttoned in, but um, a lot of people think that during those off times, the savings of the circulator not running is all we're talking about but it's not right mm -hmm. it, it, the circulator not running is one thing that's eating up a little bit of electricity and i mean a little bit but what else is not happening when that circulator is not running is the point i wanted to make and and you might be making that later so i thought i'd just throw that mm -hmm. out there for a, no i think you bring, you bring up an excellent point what is it rick that won't be running at that time <laughs> that water heater won't be banging right. <laughs> on and off like it would normally do and i'm we're, we're talking even a tank style you mm -hmm. start bringing cold water back in the bottom of that water heater you're gonna that that aquastat's gonna see that and it's gonna fire again so we're we're reducing the amount of firing and cycling of that water heater or regardless of the piece of equipment right right and especially and we we talk about tankless as well with tankless really the smart plug and anything with a timer is not a great idea for a tankless because you only want a tankless water heater to run when a water when a when a when a hot water use is imminent. Yeah. Right. That's why so many of these tanklesses now have something built into them, a circulator and a control strategy built into them for that purpose because they found that people were putting timers on these things and they were short cycling the 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 the, the, the circulator would be running even when there was no use for domestic hot water so that little so that water heater would be going bang 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 on and off on and off on and off and just basically destroying things and you know voiding the warranty so they've they're you're seeing this this trend now the tankless water heater manufacturers have their own built-in domestic hot water recirculation and circulator and control strategy which is really probably the best way to go otherwise you want an on-demand type system like the Taco genie which we're not talking about in this particular session, but we can in the future. Cool, 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 cool. All righty, some options with the, the 006 E3 and Smart Plug. This is the Smart Plus E package. So it's just simply the, 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 uh, the 006 E3 packaged with the Smart Plug, 
all right packaged with the smart plug and uh does not come with the uh with the with the with the uh fittings either but you get the fittings you get this package and if you have a recirc line bam this is a great way to go because you have the the uh flexibility and adjustability of the 0063 so you can set it up to just the right speed for the size of the system and, and watch that 1.6 or 1.4 or 1.2 gallons per minute all right so you've got that and then you have the smart plug for the intelligent control so you've got it you've got you've got yourself covered in both directions and this comes in one package if you will and you do get the line cord with that it, it, the yes. pictures don't show it but the, you get a line cord version of that pump Right. It comes, yeah, it comes with the line cord already built in. Absolutely. Also with the line cord, now we get into fittings and hoses and stuff. This is the Hot Link Plus E kit for those jobs where you don't have a domestic hot water recirc line installed. Uh, so this is retrofit, right? There, there's no chance to run a recirc line. So you have to come up with another solution using the Hot Link Plus E. And the Hot Link Plus E uses the cold water line as your recirc line with this crossover valve, this black crossover valve that is installed under the sink on the farthest fixture away. So when there's no recirc line, you use the 006E3 with the hot link crossover valve shown here, comes with hoses, comes with power cord, comes with your fittings. And um, you use that cold water line as the, as the hot water recirc line, okay? And here you can see the, the, re, the crossover valve mounted under this under a vanity okay which is where you'd put it in your farthest fixture group farthest fixture group away um now there's obviously there's got to be a question out there right someone has to ask the question whether it's yeah homeowners ask the question uh, folks in the trades we all ask the question wait a minute what the hell's going on here <laughs> we're using the, the cold water line as our research line what's the big concern you folks are out there i know you can hear me I know we haven't had a question popped in in a while. What's the concern here? If we're going to use that cold water line as our hot water research line, what, my friends, is the concern? What's the obvious there's question? There's at least a couple. At yeah, least a couple. So. At least yeah. a couple. Send us, send us some. One's wicked obvious. So type that in if you got it. I'd like to hear from you. What is the one thing we're worried about here when we do this? Way I write, Matthew, exactly. Won't the cold line get hot? Won't the cold line get hot? Well, <laughs> we sure as heck hope not. And, and because as a company, we're not irretrievably dumb, we've actually tried to address that in as, in as an effective way as possible. There are other, there are other crossover valves out there that um, actually kind of, you can almost set your clock by them or watch by them that they're gonna fail within 12 to 18 months. And you very well may get a lot of hot water in the cold water line because of a couple of reasons. A, the valve isn't very reliable and B, it's a very slow acting valve. What we've done here is we've created a very fast acting and very reliable and field serviceable valve, all right? What we have to prevent this from happening is right over here, if you look to the, to the right of your screen, the cartridge that comes with this, uh, that's part of the package, has a, has a thermal sensor disc. It's a, it's a bimetal disc sitting right there on the end of that cartridge. And what the bimetal disc does is when it senses that you know when when the water's cold all right it leaves it stays open and it allows when the circulator runs it allows for flow to go through the valve and we bring the hot water there once the hot water arrives and remember the hot water arrives not in a a slow gradual increase it's it's cool it's cool it's tepid it's tepid it's tepid it gets a little warmer a little warmer then bang almost like a slug the hot water's there because the pump just turned on right it comes in a slug. As soon as that slug of hot water gets there, the the disc will actually snap closed. It's a it's a it's it 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 literally acts that quickly. It'll snap closed and shut off the crossover. So there's no more crossover. We won't get any more hot water into the cold water line. How much actually does get over there? Uh, it, it, in reality, very very little. What we have actually seen is once that valve closes, if you go to turn the cold water faucet on. By the time you turn that cold water faucet on and get your hands underneath, oftentimes that's it. We're done. The, the hot water's been pretty much flushed out. It, it just, you don't get very much there, maybe a cup or two uh, on the other side. 
so we don't fill up the hot water, the cold water line of hot water? It's a very important question. It's an excellent question. It's something you should be concerned about when you select one of these. And fortunately, we've been we've had tremendous success with the hot link valve. And again, yep. the 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 uh, the cartridge is actually it's hand tight, and it should only ever be hand tight. Don't right. don't don't crank the sucker down with a with a with a wrench or anything. Hand tight is tight enough. And you can see right here is the thermal sensor disc. I don't know if you can see that okay. There's the thermal sensor disc, and it'll just snap from concave to convex and close off the flow uh, when the hot water arrives. So that's that's again the fail safe there that that means you don't really you don't have to worry about it. So when the hot water's there, bang, snaps just snaps shut. John, now the fl yes sir. Um, if just to sh uh, throw something out for the service guys. If you ever get a call and they've and you're going out and working on somebody else's work or something, and they say this valve is knocking, uh, make, mm -hmm. making a little bit of noise, that's the first thing to check is what John just mentioned, that somebody's probably tightened that thing up with a wrench. And what it'll do is it, it kind of smashes that snap disc that John was talking about and doesn't allow it to fully go from convex to concave or vice versa. So... The, just you guys doing service work. If you ever hear that of those things knocking, that's the first thing to look at is loosen that thing up and make sure it's only hand tight. Right. And what do we mean by hand tight? Pretty pretty simple. Again, you put it in as we show here. It's it's really loose. Now you're gonna you, you you're gonna hit some resistance here. Just keep going through the resistance until you hit a hard stop right here. Now right now right I can't move it yeah. with the same level of of effort. That's tight enough. It's watertight. It's tight enough, and we're good. Yeah. Right. Now the flow rate through this valve is rated at 0.33 GPM. 0.33 GPM. That's the limit. When you go through the the size right program and you pick this, bam, 0.33 GPM is what you have. All right. And that changes how you set up the 006 E3. Let's take a look. All right. Here we can see a system. Um, that we designed it had maybe a hundred feet of pipe out to that farthest fixture, 100, 120 feet of pipe out to that farthest fixture, one inch to three quarter to half inch. I don't, we're not worried about the line coming back because water's not going back, right? <laughs> so it's it, it, we we wind up with a with with a completely different sizing scheme here. So in this example, we had 0.33 GM, GPM with less than half a foot ahead. Now here you see the the requirement. Well, where are we going to set this sucker? got to be minimum speed right there's no reason to set it anywhere else so you you, you turn this dial all the way back to minimum and that's going nice. to be more than enough right yeah. and now we're dealing with about a five watt pump <laughs> okay a four to five watt pump and now you're dealing with efficiencies up in the one 170 you know, efficiency rating up in the 172 range and that's going to be plenty that's going to be plenty right and again with that five minutes on ten minutes off five minutes on ten minutes off cycle and you've got that two hour window, okay, it may take a couple of cycles at that flow rate to get the hot water there, but you've got that two hour window, which is why it's built in. John? Yes, sir. Uh, you might be covering this, but Kurt has a good question. He just wants to know, can you use multiple hot links with a single pump? That, who asked that? Kurt. Kurt? Kirk. Kirk? Kirk with a K. Kirk. Kirk with a K, Kirk. In the world of presentations, there are three types of questions. There are three types of questions. There's a good question, and that's any question. Good question is any question. Any question is a good question. Then there are great questions. And great questions are questions that you have a slide later on in the presentation that actually addresses that particular question. And then, Kirk, there are brilliant questions. And brilliant questions are rare, but they are brilliant. And you, my friend, just asked a brilliant question because a brilliant question is addressed by the very next click of the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, you can you can use multiples. We've actually tested this to up to six, up to six valves uh, in, a, in a system. So if you got a, a fixture, you know, a bunch of fixture groups uh, on the left-hand side of the water heater and a bunch of fixture groups on the right-hand side of the water heater, sure, you can certainly use multiple um, multiple hot link valves you don't have to upsize the pipe because it's kind of like sizing a pump for zone valve application it's the same thing right it's it's not cumulative pressure loss it's just you know whatever the worst case one is is whatever the worst case one is so yeah you you can do up to six up to six in your in your different fixture groups absolutely absolutely
Brilliant question, my man. Brilliant question. Uh, real quick, I want to make a case for pipe insulation because that five minutes on, 10 minutes off at 0.33 GPM does bring up the issue of pipe insulation. Now, pipe insulation is always a good idea for your hot water pipes. It's not just Absolutely. to keep them from freezing, although that's a good thing, but it does help speed up the hot water delivery. It reduces the heat loss, the line loss yeah. of the pipe as we're delivering hot water. Now, by how much? It's going to show you something pretty interesting here. So it keeps, it speeds up the hot water delivery. It increases the max temperature also with the water at the, at the fixtures to, to a certain degree. It also keeps pipes hot for consecutive uses. So again, if you, if you have, a, you know, a shower at six and then another shower at 645, there's a good chance that the insulated pipes have, have kept that, that hot water line nice and hot over that time. So it keeps the pipes hot for consecutive uses obviously reduces the overall line loss of the pipe which is the which is the point and hey, it saves energy which everybody wants to save energy so a great case for pipe insulation and here's what it might look like graphically so here's a typical hot water event okay uh with uninsulated pipe with uninsulated pipe it takes a while we have the 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 ambient temperature here and then we have the time it takes for delivery. So the, the, the Y axis here is temperature. The X axis down at the bottom is time. So delivery, get that hot water hot enough at the fixture. All right. That takes a little bit of time. We have the use. So that stays pretty constant. Right. And then when the use is over, you have this slow ramp down uh, uh, cool down time. All right. That's uninsulated pipe. Now, if we add insulation to the to the equation, you can see a couple of things. Number one, that the 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 ramp up curve is steepened, so it's quicker. We get up yep. to that useful temperature quicker. We have the ability to have a higher useful hot water temperature because we haven't lost that that anything going going out there. And then the ramp down time is a lot longer. So oh, if someone's going to take a shower, let's say at this point in time where my where my cursor is, we they don't have to wait for any hot water. It's still there. So if you combine the hot link plus e 0.33 gpm all right uh five minutes on 10 minutes off with the smart plug with insulated pipe going to at least as far as that farthest fixture obviously you're going to see a, a great enhancement of the of the plus hot link plus e's performance it's going to work a lot better a lot quicker and a lot faster and a lot more efficiently other than that why do it right <laughs> sorry inner wise guy coming out all right very good. Okay. And lastly, I would like to share with you some new DHW options we have just come out with uh, over the course of the last couple of months, and they should be getting out into the marketplace any time now. And these are the uh, our other ECM solutions, the 007E, 0015E3, and the 0018E, all available in stainless steel volutes now for domestic hot water recirculation options. And as you can see, they, they come in both flanged with our four-way universal flange, uh, as well as union connection. So you can get them either way right, for stainless steel applications. Now, the 007E is about as simple as it gets. It's an ECM circulator. It's a variable speed circulator, but there's only one setting. So it's a 10 foot ahead constant pressure setting. If you were to use this in a residential application just as is with a smart plug, um, you might find that it, it that five minutes on, 10 minutes off thing's gonna save you. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna save you. Uh, but you might find that you might need a circuit setter to get down to that uh, to that uh, uh, 1.6 gallons per minute limit, depending upon the hydraulics of the system. Same thing for the 0015E3, it's three settings. It's low, medium, and high. So low is five foot ahead constant pressure. Medium is 10 foot ahead constant pressure. And uh, high is full speed, fixed speed. So you'd have to see, again, looking at the charts that the, that the DHW size right program prints out for you, you'd have to see where, where the hydraulics land and what setting you might need. Um, the 0018E is the one I wanna focus on because the 0018E, as its you know, uh, hydronic heating brother, uh, has Bluetooth connectivity to an to a to an app, right? And you can you can connect to this app, and you have a opens up a world of diagnostics uh, and of programming. The part that's going to be most useful to you for the 0018E is if you really want 1.6 gallons per minute, if that's how you want to set this up, 
you can do this again without a circuit, without getting involved with a circuit setter. Again, going to be make it a little simpler, a little easier, and 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 verifiable because you can also print out the the the, the performance, the way you set it up, and say, hey, I set this thing up at 1.6. Somebody changed it. Somebody changed it. But I this is how I left it. All right. What you can do when you connect this uh, circulator to your phone or to to your not to an iPad uh, or any kind of you know any device, Bluetooth device you have the ability to to manually program it using the device and here's what it would look like you use the you use the blue setting the min max setting again infinitely adjustable fixed speed so you see the entire blue wedge is your operating mode here right that's the entire blue wedge now down at the bottom of the screen here you see 6.6 .6 gpm 9.8 feet ahead 24 watts and it gives you the rpm and that's what that does is that's a real time um, uh, uh, readout. If you take a look up here, you see this little ball here, that's on a slider. So if you take your finger and you put it on that ball, you can move that thing to the left or the right, just using your finger. And as you slide this thing down, let's say we wanna get it down to that you know, minimum setting, what you would do, like say you were using it uh, with uh, the, the the 0.33 and the, the the hot link plus valve. You wanted to get down to point you know 0.33 GPM. Really what you do is you just take that take that thing and go all the way down, and then that's that's the minimum setting. More importantly though, let's say you wanted to make sure you were at 1.6 gallons per minute for a recirc setup. Well, what you would do is you'd slide that 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 uh, blue dot back and forth until this dot right here, until this dot right here, which is your actual service point, got to 1.6 GPM and it would the head would be whatever the head actually is at 1.6 GPM it's giving you a readout of the hydraulics of the system you'll know you're there when this guy down at the bottom reads 1.6 GPM or reasonably close to it yep okay the head will read out what it is the wattage will be read out what it is but now that is verifiable and if you go into the diagnostics here or into the settings up here on the on the upper left you'll see what we're you you'll be able to verify the settings hey last time i was here this is how i set this thing up it was at 1.6 or 1.4 or whatever it happened to be so that gives you the ability without a circuit setter to actually dial that sucker into the uh to the to the exact spot that you need it and that's kind of a new level of control and a new level of programming diagnostics that really it, it, it there's nothing else like that out there in the marketplace you can set that sucker up exactly where you need it beauty so, so that's the cool thing about the 0018 e in stainless steel it gives you that capability so and also again if it's a flange setup you can put it in flange you, if you wanted a union connection you could do it in the union connection hey john i, I might have missed this but uh when john was uh introducing those new stainless steel circulators those come with the ifc in the right. box and you snap them in there right they are these are because they're, they're stainless steel they are set up with i you can get them with ifc's absolutely absolutely all righty i want to open this up for questions back uh, back to you folks again any questions you have on this was this a useful uh, uh, a useful presentation for you again we wanted to do that deep dive into the specific products and how to set them up and how to make them work for you again the, the thing to remember is this 1.6 1 1.4 1 1.2 gallons per minute limitations Folks, that's going to be part of your lives if it isn't already, uh, because lots and lots of failures are happening out there with PEX and with copper. And and the way the world is, everybody's doing this. You know, who's yeah. responsible? Who's responsible? What you don't want is it to be you, <laughs> right? You don't want you, you don't want want it to be responsible. It's why we train about. That's why we have the size right program. It's why we train on this topic. So we want to make sure you're covered. And you know what the limitations are and you know how to set up the circulators so you will achieve those limitations so you won't surpass those limitations so again the 006 e3 really really great way to go in terms of making sure you 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 have that ability to set it up you know use verifying it with the with the size right program you can set that thing up just so the 0018e you want visual verification you want in installed verification of the performance of this circulator well, bam, there's nothing nothing else out there that's going to give you that. So nice. that's very, very useful. Hey, John. Yes, sir. They, they, uh, if they want a copy of that maximum velocity sheet, that's a handout we can sure put on there or send them later or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, I didn't know if we'd 
uh, put it on there or not. I just oh, I'm sorry, I did not include that in the handout. So we will uh, we'll have to make sure. We'll, what we what we'll do is we'll put a uh, we'll put a link to that in the follow up email that's going out tomorrow. So you'll Perfect. have that available to you. Perfect. Very we good. We got some Very questions good. coming in. All right. Kurt, any concern about flow reduction from pressure drop? uh on the hot water supply line at the tank when hot water system for a large house such as two shows running at the same time two showers I'm, i assume uh any concern about flow reduction from the pressure drop in the hot water supply line uh, kirk are you talking about having the pump on the supply side going out yes okay so um Again, we don't have CVs listed for these pumps uh, because they 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 don't impart friction in the normal application. <laughs> they they apply mechanical energy or you know pressure differential. Uh, but um, yes, the answer is yes. But we just can't tell you what it is unless John, you want to take a stab at it. Oh, in terms of the in terms of the the the, the flow restriction through the through the through the pump itself. Yeah, uh, that's going to. I'd have to look, I'd have to look up what it is, but. It's is it is it a, a a major concern? Not that I've seen. Again, because uh, you know, again, the, the the bigger the bigger player here is your pipe sizing. Uh, what you have is like it, it's it's momentary um, it's momentary pressure loss more than flow restriction. Kind of like um, if you put your finger over a hose, right? If you put your your thumb over a hose and it's just over a fraction of the hose. Well, the velocity, the velocity does speed up, but the flow rate's still going to be about the same, right? If you put it over three quarters of the hose, well, yeah, the velocity goes up, but the flow rate does go down. But it's like putting just your finger over just a little bit of the hose. A uh, similar thing that a lot of people talk about, you know, with um, insert fittings, right? Uh, yeah. Let's say a, a Propex style insert fitting where you cold expand the pipe, put an insert fitting in there. The fitting itself is, um, the fitting itself the idea that fitting itself is smaller than the pipe. Well, does that mean, yeah, I've had people say, well, that just turns a half inch pipe into a three eighths inch pipe. That's BS. That's that's stupid. N that's not what it does. It's just momentary pressure loss at that point. You return to full flow uh, within it, within a, within a, a, a second or two after that, within, you know, less than a foot after that, after that pipe. So flow reduction, not so much. Would there be a, a minute amount of pressure loss? Yeah, maybe about the same as a couple of fittings in, in that respect. Um, just remember, the circulator is not providing flow to the fixtures. All right. That's the yeah. street pressure. We, we've had that question often. This is, well, wait a minute. The, the, the point, you know, 1.6 GPM or, you know, three feet per second, two feet per second. That's not enough flow to, to run two showers at the same time. The pump's not doing that. That's not the point of the pump. It's not a booster pump. It's not a delivery pump. If the pump was, if you didn't have the circulator there, you'd get pretty much the same performance in your system. I'd like to add something, John. If uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, Kirk, just realize that you, I think what you're talking about is when the circulator is installed on the hot water line going mm -hmm. out to the fixtures. You don't have to put it there. Right. You could put it on the dedicated return line coming back and it'll never impart any additional uh, pressure drop. So some people let you go in the bottom of the tank. In a lot of areas, they don't, like California is where I'm I'm not in California, but I'm real close. Uh, some of them will never let you put uh, pull that drain out of the bottom of the tank, put a T in there and and put water in there. I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's a great location. I think their worry is sediment might block it off, but you got that much sediment in a bottom of water here you want to know about it but um, yeah, there's other so problems. I just want and there's drawings we've got we got a, a nice little booklet of uh, colored uh, uh, drawings that show several different ways to pipe this stuff up so if you want those we can get you copies of that as well very good very good but yeah I, I, I think again it's a, the, the, it's important to remember the purpose of domestic hot water recirculation isn't to deliver uh, amounts of hot water to fixtures that's the pipe sizing and that's the street pressure uh, its purpose is to keep the hot water line primed. That's yep. all it does. It's we're not moving volume, we're moving heat. We're moving warmth. All right, uh, moving temperature might be the best way to put it. We want to keep the hot water line primed with hot water. That's all it's trying to do. It's not a delivery pump at all. So we, we've had that quite. I mean, I've had engineers tell me, you know, yep. wow, that pump has to be sized to deliver the hot water the total load for all the fixture units combined. And he's got this 
base mounted monster for his DHW research pump. And I go, okay, you, you sign off on it, your baby, but boy, oh boy, you're, you're going to have to explain a sprinkler system in about six to six to 10 months. I mean, and, just, and buying pumps as they go out. Cause that's not a good place to run that pump either. So exactly. he's got a, a multitude of problems if he's doing that. So yeah, there you go. There you go. All righty. Cool. Cool. Uh, here we go. We're designing new homes, mostly tankless water heaters, sometimes multiple tankless on big homes. Yep. Yep. That, that's a, yeah. That's a kind of a growing thing, and I think you, uh, as we said earlier, Bill, you're probably seeing that the 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 tankless manufacturers, because of misapplications, they're kind of taking control of their own DHW recirc by and by and large. Not it's not yeah. it's not universal, but they're taking control of that internally, and I think they should because timers and timers and tankless are uh, just a uh, just a it's a deadly combination i mean that's not you know, that's for, forget about causing the sprinkler system to to, to happen out there in the in, in the home we're we're going to burn we're going to burn out all the moving parts of that water heater and void the warranty yeah. so yeah you want to make sure uh, the tankless that you choose follow their guidelines and their own internal control strategies for domestic hot water recirculation that's really the best way to go there and again they're taking control of it because they they need to Cool. All righty. Excellent. Folks, really appreciate the gift of your time this beautiful Tuesday. I uh, hope everything's cool where you are. And uh, and uh, as we get into fall, uh, if you're in the heating areas, well, he heating season is almost among us, uh, uh, upon us. So you'll be out there doing a lot of heating systems. So that's going to be, uh, that's going to keep everybody pretty busy. As we snowing get in Wasilla. It's snowing in Wasilla. Yeah. That sounds like a country song. <laughs> well that's my old home for those who know but uh oh we got hey, and it's, eugene's it's, in juno it's yeah. 50 in juno how about that all right eugene man it's 50 in juno it's going to be fit it's get it's gotten down into the 50s here at night the last few nights here in new hampshire but uh, we're gonna, using the 70s during the day i don't think we're going to hit 80 anymore but uh boy it's a beautiful time of year and the boy when those when the leaves turn in the next uh next few weeks it's going to be crazy in new hampshire I'll tell Beauty. You Leaf yeah. peepers. <laughs> yeah. All righty, Rick. Pleasure as always working with you. Johnny, Thank you so much. You did a good job, uh, everybody. I'm sure you agree that uh, you laid it out very nicely. And uh, boy, and if you folks aren't asking questions, that's your fault. <laughs> See, that goes back to that goes back to the part of the presentation that was blind. There was I had a great I had a great <laughs> quote in there, man. I'm telling you, there was. The first part of this presentation was so visual, all right, because I went okay. out of my way to make it visual and I messed we'll up. We'll have to do it again, and we will. <laughs> right. Hey, all right, folks. Hey, Rick, thank you so much. Uh, everybody out there, thank you for the gift of your time, and we will see you again soon on Takeo Tuesday. Take care, everybody.